So what did the Germans think about the Churchill tank, specifically the Mark 1, 2 and 3? Thanks to military aviation history I got my hands on an original German report from 1942, since he stumbled across it while we were visiting the German military archives. Thanks to our supporters on Patreon for financing such trips. So in this video we will look at the report and also check for any errors in the report itself. First a bit of context. The Churchill tank saw its first operational use in August 1942 during Operation Jubilee, also known as the Dieppe Raid. The raid was an allied amphibious operation involving mostly Canadian forces. It was to test the feasibility of an amphibious landing. Now I know what you might be thinking. Is this really a good way to test a new tank? Well I would say no, although I think it is the best way to deliver your enemy your newest tank model. So he is able to capture and test your model. The Germans almost repeated this mistake by first using their Tigers in the swampy terrain near Leningrad. But it was not until January 1943 during a Soviet offensive the two were captured. But back to the Churchill. David Fletcher outlines the thinking at the time as follows. Although with hindsight it may seem strange that the latest British tank still effectively on the secret list should be abandoned in this way. One should remember that the force was supposed to be landed and withdrawn before the Germans reacted. But we are talking about World War II tanks here, tanks are reliable and break down, heavy tanks even more so. For instance in January 1942 a report noted that 42% of the Churchills were off the road. Finally it is hard enough to recover a heavy tank anywhere even under good circumstances. On top of that even if you manage to pull back your broken down heavy tank to the beach, you still have to get it into your landing craft and this was also the first amphibious landing of tanks in history. Although there are also arguments for the use of tanks in this operation. First off, the German garrison was expected to be very weak. Spoiler, it wasn't. Second, that the Churchill was the toughest tank available and third, it was also unknown to the Germans. Although I don't think these points really outweigh the risks involved. Before we look at the report, a short look at the total number of tanks involved. The Commonwealth forces brought a total of 58 Churchill tanks, yet 28 of them were never sent in. Of the other 30, one failed to disembark. Of the 29 that attempted to land, two of them drowned. Hence 27 made it on land. According to a German report, they managed to capture 28 tanks in total. So let us look at the German report from 12 September 1942. It starts off with some basics. Details about the English tank and its evaluation. The English tank Churchill Mark 1 to 3 is a heavily armored infantry tank, so not a fast tank. This is followed by technical data like weight, which is given with 35 slash 40 metric tons, which is the same value as in British handbooks according to Nigel Montgomery, so likely the Germans captured one of those. The short assessment is negative. The tank offers nothing worth noting to the experts. Neither constructively, meteorologically, nor weaponry wise does it bring anything new. About the armament is stated, the 7.62 vehicle cannon, which was the 3 inch howitzer, of the tank is poor and obsolete. The 4 cm vehicle cannon, the 2 pounder, is obsolete in design and effect. The 5.7 cm vehicle cannon, this is the 6 pounder, does not match the Russian gun of the same caliber and performance. Nothing new or noteworthy has been found in the captured ammunition. Although the 4 cm 2 pounder was definitely better than the German 37mm gun, by summer 1942 it was clearly outdated. About a 5.7 cm 6 pounder, this gun was also produced by the Americans in license as the 57mm gun M1. Although with a barrel length of 50, whereas the early Churchill 3 used a barrel length of just 43, which means weaker penetration capabilities. Due to the land lease program, the Soviets also received the American gun. Luckily, in 1942, the Soviets did compare this weapon to their own 57mm IS 1 anti tank gun. So we can actually see if the statement in the report matches their assessment. According to the Soviets, the difference in penetration value is at 90 degrees versus follows. At 100m, the 6 pounder managed 78mm, whereas the IS 1 achieved 98mm. At 500 meters, 
we have 63 mm versus 86 mm. Considering that the gun on the Churchill 3 had a lower barrel length, the German assessment is correct assuming that the Sovat values are not completely off. Although it is important to note that the longer 6 pounder with improved ammunition later in the war was quite a capable gun, but this ammo was not available yet or at least not captured by the Germans. The next part is about armor protection. The armor of the tank is strong, but the material can be described as poor and cannot be compared with the armor used on the German or Russian tanks. This is also shown by the penetration tests. I am not entirely sure how correct or valid this statement actually is, especially since sword armor quality highly fluctuated depending on the plant and production date. According to the Russian mechanical engineer Kavalerchik, he notes about cracks in the armor of the T-34 in 1941. However, perhaps the main reason for the cracks was the low quality of the armor. The point is that the USSR at the time didn't have enough precise instruments to control the temperature and chemical composition of the metal in the furnaces, and thus the smelting was frequently a matter of guesswork. Although he notes that the rate dropped over the course of the war. Nevertheless, in the summer of 1942, up to 45% of the factory number 183rds armored hulls and up to 89% of Uramar's armored hulls had cracks. By the end of the year, the rate of this defect had dropped to 10%, but was never totally eliminated during the whole war. As such, the statement about the armor quality seems to be inconsistent with the data available. The other statement in terms of armor protection is about the general armor layout, and it is not without irony. The armor provides large impact angles, so the shape is not modern either. Sadly, I don't know if the author of the report knew about the Tiger 1. Likely not, since the Tiger saw first action in late August 1942 near Leningrad, which was about two weeks before this report was written. And it is a bit of doubt that the Tiger also had a rather unmodern armor layout as well. The longer part of the report notes that only two tanks were penetrated by German anti-tank gun fire, likely of the caliber size 37 to 50 mm. Yet another report from a core notes it were 37 mm. On this report, the army command responded that the troops likely did not aim accurately enough and engaged from too far away. According to the Allied report, no tank was penetrated with the crew still inside. At least one author suggests that the penetration might have happened after the tanks were abandoned. And some might note that the report is rather unfair, yet we need to consider that the German units that were stationed at Dieppe were equipped mostly with captured and or outdated equipment. For instance, the experience report of the 81st Army Corps notes that two infantry battalions had three 4.7 cm anti-tank guns, which likely were Czech anti-tank guns, which begs the question if those achieved the penetrating shots. Yet there's another aspect here as well. It might be that the Germans had some measuring errors when it came to the armor thickness. The blueprints of the tanks provided note armor thickness of 87 mm for the front armor of the turret and hull. Yet according to the British wartime diagrams reprinted in a book by David Fletcher, the armor thickness was 4 inch 102 mm for the turret front and 3.5 inch 89 mm for the lower hull. Maybe I missed something here, but it seems the turret armor is incorrect in the German files. The next part is about the tracks, and it's rather long compared to the others. The track is made of very brittle material of crew construction. It shatters every time it is fired upon, which is not the case with German and Russian tracks. The tracks cause great noise, so that radio communication in the tank is certainly hampered. This forces to stop often to be able to hear the radio messages. These are then the best moments to attack the tank. This is very interesting in many ways because the observation that the tracks broke under fire might not be necessarily incorrect, yet this likely was the result not only caused by the projectile alone, since the beach at Dieppe had a special feature, pebbles, but not your regular pebbles on which the British tested the Churchill, to be more specific it consists of church stones that stressed the tracks considerably, and as such might have weakened them. A geological engineer and veteran of the Dieppe raid that after the war examined the beach notes, the entire beach is composed of church stones, boulders and rubble, which after tidal action eventually rest at an angle of repose of about 15 to 20 degrees. Secondly, these rocks will extend many meters in depth, so vehicles cannot dig down to a solid rock base for traction. 
When a tractor or wheeled vehicle tries to climb up the slope, it immediately digs itself down. When the tracks are turned to either side, the stones roll in between the drive sprocket and track and the object that first gives away is the pins holding the track links. Hugh Henry notes that one tank was immobilized by the church stones and four had the tracks broken by shell fire, four by the church and three most likely by the church, although this is not certain. This is also mentioned later in the German report, although they note that several, not just one tank, was immobilized by the church. Several tanks were digging into the gravel and getting stuck. Tracks also apparently broke due to jamming with the debris shoveled onto the upper track and overstressing. So about the tracks, I'm not sure if the German assessment is correct in regards to the suspectability to damage from anti-tank guns. Although according to Nigel Montgomery, the Churchills at Dieppe were also equipped with unsuited tracks. The tanks were all fitted with what is referred to even in early manuals as heavy cast steel track old type. So even if the tracks were as weak as the German report assumes, this would change once better tracks would be issued. Finally, the general assessment is summed up in one sentence. In summary, it can be said that the English tank Churchill in its present configuration is easily compatible. Now some might note that this statement is unfair. Yet we need to consider the context here. First, the defending unit was already mentioned some second line unit and mostly equipped with dated and or captured equipment. To illustrate this, consider this outtake about moving German reserves during the Allied attack. It is from a wartime report that was reprinted in a post-war divisional history. The movement of the 1st Battalion of the Infantry Regiment 571 by bicycles has not been fully successful. A great many bicyclists have broken down during the journey because the construction is too weak for the load. Due to the failures, up to 60%, the companies are spread out. Second, in 1941, the Wehrmacht was able to drive the Red Army close to the gates of Moscow. While all of their tanks and anti-tank guns were generally unable to penetrate the armor of the Soviet KV-1 and KV-2 tanks. Which meant they had to resort to either a very lucky hit, the Flak 88mm, artillery fire or infantry anti-tank tactics. And the difference between the Churchill and KV-1 in terms of armor and mobility are limited. So let us briefly compare the KV-1 from 1941 and the Churchill Mark III early. In terms of armor protection, the Churchill had 102mm for the turret front, whereas the KV-1 had only 75mm, yet at 20 degree, so around 80mm of effective armor thickness. For the front hull, the Churchill had 89mm, whereas the KV-1 had again 75mm, yet this time at 30 degree, so about 87mm of effective thickness. In terms of speed, the Churchill had a maximum speed of 26 km per hour, whereas the KV-1 had 34 km per hour. Yet in terms of mobility, the power to weight ratio is more important. The KV-1 had a power to weight ratio of 10.64 horsepower per metric ton, whereas the Churchill had 8.75 horsepower per metric ton, thus being more mobile than the Churchill. Additionally, as you can see, the Churchill is also larger, which means more likely to being hit. So since the Germans were able to deal with a slightly lower armored yet more mobile tank in 1941, it is not surprising that by summer of 1942, when they were producing the long barreled Panzer IV, and anti-tank weapons better suited to deal with the Soviet tanks, that they were not particularly concerned about tanks like the Churchill 1 or 3. If they changed their opinion is a good question. One book stated that the Germans started to fear the Churchill, but it didn't provide a source. So I'm a bit hesitant here, especially since the book didn't have a single German source listed. To summarize, the German assessment of the Churchill tanks captured at the Dieppe raid was negative. A closer examination of the assessment shows that some points were valid, although the statements about armor quality and layout seem unfair and are likely at least partially wrong. The aspect about the weak tracks seems to have not taken into consideration that those might have been weakened by the stones on the beach. As such, reaching probably wrong conclusion and hence the Churchill might be far harder to immobilize than the report suggests. Also be aware that there were many German reports on the landing itself from various levels of command. I only touched a few briefly throughout this video. Well, I hope you learned something new. Thank you to Chris from Military Aviation History for pointing me to the original report in the Bundesarchiv. 
Thanks to Stan from Tank Encyclopedia for pointing me towards various sources and answering various questions during the script writing. Thank you to Andrew for reviewing the script. Thanks to Jesse from Real Time History for pointing me towards various sources. Although keep in mind that any errors are my own. Special thanks to all my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar for making videos like this possible. Sources are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.